and welcome to Hudson Institute. My name is Peter Rao. I'm a senior fellow here and the director of our Center on Europe and Eurasia. And it's my pleasure to welcome today to Hudson Institute the chairs of the foreign policy committees of the respective uh, parliaments from Ukraine, Lithuania, and Poland, uh, which we can also call the Lublin Triangle, uh, in a nod to the Union of Lublin from 1569 between the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the three countries in I think it was July 2020, uh, launched this Lublin Triangle, which we can consider something of an alliance uh, or a pact or a, or a configuration of the three countries committed to the territorial integrity of Ukraine, which already at that point, owing to the Russian intervention in 2014, uh, was under assault. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome all three of you. I'll begin with my immediate left from Ukraine, Oleksandr Marechko, who uh, earned his reputation as an expert in international legal matters and international uh, trade. Uh, he has taught to continue the theme at the John Paul II Lublin Catholic University in Poland, at Kiev National University, and uh, for our American viewers, also had a relationship with Penn State uh, Dickinson, where he taught uh, in the United States briefly as well. And he's a prolific author. Uh, from Lithuania, you might recognize the former ambassador to the U.S. Welcome back, Mr. Ambassador. He was posted here as the Lithuanian ambassador to the U.S. and to Mexico for five years, from 2010 to 2015. Uh, he is um, uh, a former diplomat, a member of the Lithuanian parliament, and uh, really one of Lithuania's strongest voices on foreign policy and foreign affairs. And last, but certainly not least, from Poland, Radoslav Fogiel, who is a member of the lower house of Poland's parliament. He also served as a deputy chairman of the European Young Conservatives and in regional parliament uh, in his home region of Poland. So thanks to all three of you. Uh, maybe I would just begin where I, where I sort of left off with my introduction, and that is about the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Uh, and perhaps I'll just begin with you. There was a concept rolled out by the former NATO Secretary General, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, together with uh, Andrei Yermak some time ago, this so-called Rasmussen plan uh, about Ukraine security. Ukraine also wants to be within NATO. Uh, then there have been other concepts bandied about, about just supplying Ukraine with enough to be able to push out the Russians and to establish deterrence. Uh, what is it that Ukraine really sees as necessary for its defense um, and for its kind of future uh, relationship with the West and with Russia? Well, uh, first of all, Ukraine uh, has made its choice, and it's a transatlantic choice. We have included in our constitution provision that uh, Ukraine uh, should become a member of NATO and should become a member of the European Union. And I believe that we should become member of NATO as soon as possible. And I'm in favor of and I'm campaigning uh, for Ukraine to be admitted to NATO immediately because I believe that it will stop Putin's aggression. And this is one of the reasons why three of us came here to Washington uh, to continue this uh, uh, campaign. And it is also necessary to underscore that Ukraine is part of the West. And we are fighting not only for our territorial integrity and sovereignty, we are fighting for certain values. They're very simple, but they are absolutely necessary values like democracy, like human rights and rule of law. So, and we're part of the West. And what sort of uh, feedback did you get from your interlocutors on the Hill and in the administration when you bring up this desire to be in NATO? Well, um, the reaction to tell you the truth, was a little bit mixed because, uh, first of all, um, it's important to, to highlight that uh, some of our colleagues were, I would even say, enthusiastic about this. So they uh, wholeheartedly support us. At the same time, there were some of them who were more hesitant. Uh, but I think that we need to continue our work and we need to persuade those who are hesitant right now or reluctant night, uh, right now uh, but I'm sure that we will prevail eventually. And um, as you, as a Lithuanian, uh, head to, to meetings with your European Union counterparts and your NATO counterparts, what, what, uh, what reception do you think uh, this Ukrainian application to NATO and to the EU has within uh, and amongst your European colleagues? Well, most important is uh, not to make uh, strong judgments on any reaction because your reaction or Western reaction is process and construction. Mm -hmm. You know, when we revolted against the Soviets 32, three years ago, more or less, 
nobody wanted to hear us. We've been receiving very big, long official letters. Don't please do it. No, stay, stay with Gorbachev. It will be OK. Uh, we never listened to those voices. Uh, then, then we asked for EU and NATO membership. Nobody wanted to admit us. And it was a fight uh, to get uh, uh, attention. Uh, it started with heroes like Dan Fried. Was it 95 when he created the group of great think tankers who, who were brave enough to see that it's doable. Baltics, uh, we can defend Baltics. Baltics has a future, and that vision, you know, born. Look to us today. You know, I'm joking sometimes. My salary grew more or less 600 times from those years when I began. We are one of, well, very, very close to the average of EU. When we started, we were, I don't know, 7% of it. We shine, we inspire. But to make Washington believe, it took about a decade. Uh, Ukrainians doesn't have that time. But look what we did with candidate status. Nobody was even thinking in EU that EU might open door for Ukrainians. And we are very close to start accession talks with them. It will take three, four years. We consider that in 2027, when Lithuania will be presidency, they should finish accession talks, and in 2029, they will accede to European Union. But the problem with American leadership in this region, that you stopped leading America and the West, hearing big, impressive Putin speech in 2007 in Munich, as a collective West, we kneeled in front of Putin, and we started to listen to every word he says. He paralyzed our will to have our own agenda, and we felt the victim of his own agendas. And what, is, what kind of agenda it is? Killings, occupations, annihilation, kind of fascist agenda of today. So question to the West. Will you continue doing Munichs, Yaltas, Minsks? Will you continue appeasing the evil and just surrendering territories? Will you allow democracy to be killed globally? Or will you fight for values that are enshrined in your constitution, in United Nations Charter? And I think it's time to fight, because actually Ukrainians are doing it for you. They are dying for us and you. Because if you don't do it, communist China will learn it. And one day you wake up in a totally different world, when you will have to defend your values and maybe even your territory in a way Ukrainians are defending it today. I couldn't agree more, and I think uh, uh, Poland sees it very similarly, and uh, Polish officials have made their views on this pretty clear. Poland seems to have a special influence in Washington. Uh, I think when a lot of Americans look at Poland, they see uh, a plucky, sort of tough-minded nationalist country that uh, believes in itself and is willing to stand up to the Russian bear. Uh, what kind of reception have you gotten um, I'm here in Washington, and how are you using your special influence to make the case for Ukraine? First of all, this was the whole idea to come here as three countries, two countries advocating for the third one, Lithuania and Poland, but also to come here together as the countries who once had the biggest uh, empire in Europe, but also the first democratic country in Europe. Our constitution, the constitution of the Commonwealth, was um, adopted just four years after the American Constitution. We have this in common. Our heroes, our common heroes like General Kościuszko or General Pułaski, uh, fought here in the U.S. for the for the freedom of American people. And I think this is this is one of the reasons that our our uh, histories, our values, are so uh, close, so entangled. We lost our uh, independence for more than 100, 120 years. Then we lost our independence again, our sovereignty for 50 years of Cold War. It's painful to say, but we were sold by some of our former allies in Yalta. We suffered it. We re-emerged. And now we need to do the same for Ukraine. 
you were asking about uh, our reception here uh, in in DC. Obviously, Poland is uh, treated as a genuine partner because we are doing our part of the job. We are not trying to uh, to hide behind America's back. We are spending this year. Poland will spend four percent of our GDP for defense. It's twice as much as the NATO requirement. There are others that, that are not doing it. We need to push them, we need to motivate them. But thanks to that, we can, um, we can equally talk to our American counterparts and they know that we, in our part of, the, uh, of, of Europe, because it's not just Poland, it's Lithuania, the Baltic states, uh, other countries like, like uh, Czech Republic, we are doing our share. And we just need the leadership and the contribution of, of uh, the American people. And that's why I must say I was uh, very satisfied uh, seeing that there is a bipartisan, mostly there is a bipartisan consensus when it comes to supporting Ukraine, when it comes to realizing how crucial this is and that this is not a regional uh, war. This is not something that uh, doesn't concern uh, the US that doesn't concern Africa, that doesn't concern Asia, because what Putin's Russia is doing, it's not only breaking the international law, attacking Ukraine, it's not only committing war crimes, raping and killing civilians, they are also trying to terrorize others, for instance, by destroying Ukrainian gray, grain, they, they try to, uh, they try to create hunger crisis in Africa. Uh, as it was already said, if another authoritarian regime there is out there will see that you can attack a nearby democratic country and go unpunished, they will not hesitate. This is what makes the whole thing global. Yeah, I, I think uh, most, most observers would, would, would share all of that. I think the one fear that has put a break on, on some support for Ukraine among some quarters of the US, and I would say quite frankly this includes parts of the administration, is this so-called worry about, about escalation. What do you say to, uh, what do you say to, um, uh, to Americans who say, you know, if we support Ukraine too much, then uh, a nuclear power, nuclear armed Russia might escalate? Um, to, to, to threaten the West altogether. How do you respond? To that? I heard this argument several times, but mostly from my European colleagues, European counterparts. And I think it's, a, it's terribly wrong logic behind it, because first of all, we shouldn't succumb to nuclear blackmail. If we do, uh, someday mm. Putin might start blackmailing the United States and asking for Alaska. You, you know, so that's why it, it's it's absolutely wrong logic. Uh, from what we can see, Putin is a coward, and when uh, his provocations are met with force, with decisiveness, he backs down. The best example of that are is um, Sweden and Finland joining NATO, and Putin not only didn't do anything, he didn't say anything against this, because each time when he sees that there is strong reaction from the position of strength. He backs down. So we shouldn't be afraid of him. He is provocateur, but he is also a coward. He's a typical bully, you know. And we should respond with all strength, and it might stop him. Yeah, I also think that he is creating potentially a very hazardous precedent by taking the theory of nuclear deterrence, which has always been one of defensive protection and creating an offensive blackmail component to it. If other countries around the world see this as, as a way of deterring the United States or the West from supporting a country like Ukraine, they might conclude that they too want nuclear weapons. And uh, that could, from an American point of view, I think, create a nuclear weapons cascade um, that's rather dangerous. If I may try and jump yeah, in, because uh, I'm hearing the word escalation quite often recently, and I must say, Sometimes it makes me laugh because uh, if we don't stop Russia right now in Ukraine, if we don't let Ukrainians stop them, this will be the moment that we will have escalation. Let's see at, uh, at history. It's quite I saw Foreign Minister Lavrov threaten Moldova today. You're next, so in that vein. Yeah. It's quite mm -hmm. a recent history. 
In 2007, Putin in Munich during his speech uh, said that NATO enlargement will lead to war. And we concede, we didn't do NATO enlargement. We just promised something vaguely to Ukraine and uh, to Georgia in um, Bucharest in 2009. So we did as Putin wanted. And where did, us, uh, did it lead us? To war. We had war in 2008, we had annexation of Crimea in 2014, and we have full-scale war today. So Putin doesn't need our invitation. Putin doesn't need to be provoked. He's provoked if we are uh, bending to his will. So right now we can strike a decisive blow to this evil empire without engaging American, European, NATO forces. If Ukraine fails, then Moldova, Georgia, Lithuania, maybe Poland, we will be next. And this will require American boots on the ground because then Article 5 will be, will be triggered. So if we want to avoid escalation, we need to be decisive and strong right now. And I will also maybe add, uh, this is exactly our mentality of survival. If Russians escalate, you escalate even more. And then they de-escalate. Because they know that you are afraid of this escalation, and they control you by, by fear. Remember the first words of John Paul II. Empires control people by fear. And I remember standing in front of Soviet tanks who killed my friends at TV Tower. I remember we gathered at the parliament and we were not afraid. And I remember the Red Army stopped. We had no guns. We just had our feelings, our identity, and it stopped. The same Solidarność did, the same everybody did. And this use of a kind of fear as an argument not to have a policy, for me, it's not America. For me, it's so defeatist. For me, it's just an excuse not to do anything. What I feel after this visit to America, yes, you did a lot, but you are afraid to win. You better, you better, you, you better do some, some kind of things you did in Afghanistan. You remember how it ended. If you don't have this end game strategy, if you don't really know where you go in Ukraine, if you don't want to seal it in NATO like you did it in Polish or Baltic case, it will be another Afghanistan. Are you ready for it? I'd also argue that the feckless ending to Afghanistan, at least in part, shaped Putin's calculation on going for the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And the next logical step would be if the Americans fall down and the West falls down in Ukraine, I'm sure Beijing would have its own views on what that means about potentially the Taiwan Straits. That might be overly simplifying it, but political will matters. In the end, this is a political question of political will. So that then, I, I suppose, just takes me to the basic, most fundamental question. Um, if you're in the Oval Office with the president, what would you advise him should his policy be then? What it, should the American sort of political goal be in Ukraine? And since you're the Ukrainian, I'll start with you and just go down the line. Yeah, yeah it's very simple. Uh, first of all, what I, what I would recommend to, to American president uh, to provide Ukraine with all, absolutely all necessary heavy weaponry of highest quality and contemporary heavy weaponry. Uh, second, I would take this um, brave decision and I would do everything to persuade uh, members of NATO to admit Ukraine to NATO uh, immediately. Um, this, this would be my suggestions, the most basic. Well, if I see uh, President Biden... When do you fly out? There's still time here. <laughs> I, I would say, I would remind him his inauguration speech. I was more or less crying when I listened to it because it expressed what those bloodland nations, as we are called by Timothy Snyder, mm -hmm. between Baltic and Black Sea, what we feel. We want the world to fight for democracy, but not to sacrifice as in Yaltas. You know, a lot of Lithuanians, Poles, and Ukrainians, 
dead because of your appeasement policies. Dead. 30,000 troops in Lithuania were fighting the Soviets and learning English, waiting for Americans to come. All of them killed. And when we saw President Bush landing 20 years ago after Prague NATO summit, and, we sa and when he said, from now on, every enemy of Lithuania is the enemy of the United States, we again cried, because that's exactly what we expect from America, if you are still America. So President Biden, if you want your inauguration speech to become a reality, defeat Putin's regime, the most evil regime on the planet that was never tried, never jailed for anything. You've been, you know, Roosevelt and other guys, they were shaking the hands of the killer for so many years. And if you want to be a monument like Reagan, and if you want to create Europe whole and free that Bush the father wanted to create from 89, do it now. And it's not only Ukraine, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, Cuba, 60, 70% of the problems will be wiped out with one blow that is very inexpensive, to be honest. You know, you are not putting your you know, boots on the ground, you are just giving them weapons. Yeah, I'd like to make this point that our annual defense budget runs between eight to nine hundred billion U.S. dollars, basically to deter against two major adversaries, the Chinese and the Russians. And here, with to date twenty-five or so billion dollars in military assistance, Ukraine has destroyed a huge percentage of the Ukraine of the Russian conventional military, and we have not spilled a single drop. Uh, of American blood. If that's not, and I don't mean to make it a crass investment question, but if that isn't a good investment, um, I'm, I'm not sure what is. I don't know if you wanted to add. Uh, yeah, the efficiency is uh, is amazing, and we should uh, we should really take that in co into consideration. But in the shortest of words, what <laughs> what I I could say, I, I would say, Mr. President, just drop the failed policies of the past, and listen to those countries who know Russia and who were right all over. To the countries that were warning the West, but they didn't they weren't listened. Just listen to them, we'll send you a note. All right, Mr. President, if you're watching, you've got your, uh, your marching orders. And maybe I'll come back to, to put a bow on the NATO question, just come back to, to you, Mr. Ambassador, because obviously you're hosting the NATO summit this summer in Vilnius. Uh, can you give us a preview of what to expect and, and where you think the discussion might go? I know it's some months away and the preparatory work is only going to begin. It's also a dynamic situation. But in case I don't see you between now and then, here's as good a chance as ever to ask about your expectations. Well, we are just you know one of 30 countries that shapes the agenda. But I think it's very natural that we will, first of all, start with our own military muscles. Defense spending, please. Please, two percent is just the beginning. It's just on what on what we stand, and ceiling might much be much much bigger. Today, little Lithuania is closing to three percent. We need to build our military muscles. We need to 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 build up our military industries. That's the basics, and then. Enlargement of Finland and Sweden, 32 countries, and opening the door. Not in a way Bucharest did, but really and actually opening the door for Ukrainians, who are one of the strongest army on this planet, who can defeat our direct military threat that, like we understand it from Madrid NATO summit. They are contributor of stability. The whole NATO will be happy to embrace them and finish it and make such, send such a message to Russia that they will never, ever be able to do it. Yeah, the quip, I think, uh, when it became clear that Ukraine was putting up a tough fight early on was that Ukraine doesn't need to join NATO. NATO needs to join <laughs> exactly. Ukraine. And I think uh, uh, the last almost year now is borne that out. Let me ask one other uh, uh, question about one other sort of objection that, that swirls out there. And that, of course, is this issue of corruption that one hears about a lot. Traditionally, it's no secret that uh, Ukraine has ranked pretty low on the indexes of corruption and all the rest. Uh, I quite frankly would argue that 
uh, corruption comes with Kremlin influence. So the extent to which you can push the Russians out, you actually help achieve an anti-corruption agenda uh, for Ukraine. But for those out there listening who, who might be wavering or, or hear these, uh, these, uh, these accusations that Ukraine can't be a trusted partner because of corruption and should we really fund them, et cetera, what's your, what's your answer to that? Well, first of all, when President Zelensky came to power, a uh, struggle, a uh, fight against corruption was one of the, the most important elements of his uh, platform, of his program. And what he did, he did more for a few years in power as a president, he did more than was previously done because now we have developed and very advanced in a sort of anti-corruption infrastructure, which consists of uh, elements such as, for example, special agency, anti-corruption agency or prosecutor office, uh, also anti-corruption prosecutor office and so on. And uh, the most recent examples, as you can see, in these days we have a wave of resignations uh, a way when people got fired, because uh, if uh, we have the policy of zero tolerance to corruption, because we understand that corruption is our serious enemy, especially in times of war, it might cost us a lot. If there is any suspicion regarding corruption, it might uh, uh, damage the supply of support, financial support and, and weaponry from the West. We are aware of this. And we are committed to continue the struggle. And in the recent days, you can see that even if there is a shadow of, of doubt uh, related to corruption, uh, these people are being removed, uh, no matter which positions they take in, in the government. And can I add just one word from Lithuanian road to transformation? We had our own little oligarchs, our own feats, so we have it was to, to steal, to survive. You know, it, my salary was $5 a month. How can you live with a salary? Well, I was not stealing, but everybody was stealing. That's a Soviet habit, to steal. And you know when we killed that virus? With the EU accession. Mm -hmm. When we had German, Scandinavian, American business coming, when we introduced competition laws, state aid laws, they were coming and saying, what? This guy is taking bribes. We don't want to live in the country we invest to make it fair. And now America and Germany is the biggest trade partners, the biggest investors. We, you know, we are pure like Scandinavians. We are Scandinavian banks, Scandinavian telecommunications. If you leave country in a gray zone, if you do not open the door to you and NATO, if you expect them to be pure like, I don't know what, forget about it. So this is our, our responsibility. Open the door. We kill that virus but kill that virus inside the family. The EU is the best on that, but for you to make that miracle, we need a fence. We need you know, big American fence for those animals never come to, to the territories they never belong to them. I would agree with that. I'd also say though that I think the war itself has had some cleansing effect, or at yes. least that's my impression from the outside. Um, there's always gonna be a certain amount of war profiteering in any conflict, but clearly, Ukraine would not be able to match the Russians if these weapons weren't getting to the front lines. And so some of these accusations strike me as silly because I think when it comes to matters of war and death, there has been a, a, a national rallying around the flag and around, around, um, around uh, Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's possible, speaking of the battlefield, to check the Russians at the front but lose the war because of economic collapse. And so setting aside the military aid, uh, what does Ukraine most need on you know, direct budgetary assistance, on economic? We just had the mayor and deputy mayor of Bucha um, in uh, yesterday or the day before. And um, when I visited Bucha in November, generators were big on the agenda. I mean, what are some of the things that you need and that um, your, your friends and allies in the United States can, can help rally and provide, aside from the military stuff? Yeah, yes, we're in difficult economic situation because uh, by waging this war, and we should remember that Putin is waging this war against, not only against Ukrainian army, but against Ukrainian people, against uh, Ukrainian critical infrastructure, uh, power grid, for example. He's destroying deliberately. And we already have huge losses. Uh, they amount to uh, 300 billion US dollars. And our economy is continuing to be damaged by Russian aggression. Uh, we are, the very fact that 8 million Ukrainians 
became refugees, had to leave their homes and to go abroad. It's a huge blow to our economy. Uh, because of the blackouts, um, uh, small and medium-sized business is just, uh, is just dying. You know, we're bleeding economically. Uh, but to me, I'm not economist. I have my own kind of perception and my own version of what is to be done. I believe that our first priority should be human capital, development of human capital. What I'm afraid of uh, most of all is that we can lose a new generation of young people. They can go abroad and they can stay. That's why it's extremely important for us, with the help of our friends, our allies, to create such conditions in Ukraine, which would give uh, chances and opportunities for young people to stay and to work on the rebuilding uh, their motherland. It's extremely important. So, uh, and I believe here in what I call civil and to stop Putin from stealing your children, uh, which I would say exactly is it, also just an unbelievable crime yes. of epic proportions. But yes, yes, uh, uh, what's happening? Uh, the transfer of children, deportation of children, forcible. It's one of the elements of genocide according to the Convention on the Prevention of Genocide of 1948. It's, it's, it's terrible crime. So our, our mm, uh, biggest priority are people, are people in Ukraine, uh, to help them to, to survive, because uh, budget deficit right now is uh, 5 billion US dollars per month. It, it's huge, it's huge. We don't receive uh, the same amount of money as a help from the West. Uh, so, but. Um, it's going to be another challenge. But right now, we have to survive and we have to liberate our territory. And eventually uh, encourage the refugees you're hosting to return to Ukraine to help uh, rebuild, presumably. We will offer them our hospitality as long as it's needed. Right. They, are, they are not refugees in Poland. They're our guests. And uh, we've uh, accepted few million of war refugees from Ukraine without creating one refugee camp. There is no refugee, there, is, there isn't even one refugee camp in Poland. Mm -hmm. They are staying with us, with our families, with, with our friends, and we will do it as long as it takes. But of course, they deserve to go home. They deserve to uh, go and rebuild their, their home country. Last time when I was uh, in DC, in November, in November 2022, I was uh, invited to speak at uh, this uh, fundraiser. They were raising uh, money to build a bomb shelter in one of the, of the Ukrainian schools so the kids can go to school. Imagine, you need a bomb shelter so your kids can attend classes. No one should be doing that. It, it is not normal. And this is what we are against. Given the enormous generosity that um, Lithuania and Poland have shown to Ukraine, uh, and generally in these various trackers like the Kiel tracker and elsewhere, the Baltic states, Poland, and really uh, one could say the entire B9 states of, of, of Eastern Europe are outperforming a bit some Western European countries. The Riga format was just announced by your foreign ministers. The Tallinn Pledge um, is a very robust um, a pledge coordinated by the UK and, of course, Estonians and others. Both of your governments are members of both that format and that pledge. Um, is it fair to say that, um, without describing Europe as split between East and West, what might be an antiquated way of looking at it, that um, there's perhaps, putting it in a positive way, a new leadership emerging where Eastern Europe uh, leads Europe um, um, welded together between your three states and, and others kind of into, into a, a new direction? Or is that, is that over-interpreting events? And I take that to any of you, I don't know. Definitely, definitely. Now it's time uh, for our region to lead, especially that we have such an expertise in, in the topic. And I don't want to point fingers because uh, what we need right now is we need headlines. You got to point. You got to point fingers. <laughs> but we also more than headlines. We need make my public affairs team <laughs> more, than, more than headlines. We need solidarity and unity in in Europe within NATO right now. So yes, we are spending uh, four percent of GDP. Yes, Lithuania is spending three percent, and yes, there are countries that are not uh, doing their fair share. But we expect them. To catch up we expect them to get better because uh, 
only when we work together we can we can achieve anything nato has been quite dormant for for a while uh, we believed that even uh, brain dead some would say yeah we believed after after the uh, after the the enlargement uh, when poland and and uh, lithuania and the czech republic joined uh, just recently we accepted montenegro mm, uh, but this was just technical i think we believed that fukuyama was right and uh, there's nothing awaiting us that there will be prosperity and peace but unfortunately we may live in the best of possible worlds but it's not a perfect world and uh, as Zygmunta said we need we need um, uh, defense we need defense spending we need deterrence not appeasement we need real deterrence because only then we can be uh, we can be safe so yes if that needs some courage if that needs some conviction if that needs some decisiveness to to do this to encourage other to motivate other countries we are ready to do it and do you think i'll stay with you and then have you answer that as well do you think um uh, uh you know i would say it's unclear if there's an offensive coming a counter offensive no one really knows how that's going to unfold on, on the battle front in the coming months but I do have the sense that both Ukraine and Russia are prepared to fight for some time. And, um, and there are some, uh, I think, analysts who worry that, at least in some parts of Europe, there's going to be flagging attention or interest or willingness to the support. Do you, do you think that we can maintain a strong transatlantic cohesion on this? And uh, if you worry about it, what are the ingredients to strengthening it and making sure it doesn't, doesn't weaken? I'm not sure about Russia, but I'm pretty sure that Ukrainians uh, won't stop. They won't. Uh, they won't stop fighting. They they will fight till till they win. That's uh, I'm absolutely sure. But on the other hand, we need to avoid a situation when Ukraine is held held hostage by by Russia. Mm -hmm. You can very easily prevent uh, even taking into consideration that we have some sort of frozen conflict. You can very easily prevent any uh, external uh, investment by firing a missile or two every week on Kiev or Lviv. No foreign company, no foreign investment will come to a country like that. So that's why we need this decisive victory, as we, as we said before. And uh, of course, there is some growing fatigue uh, in Western societies, as terrible as this may sound, we know from our uh, from our meetings on the Hill that American constituents also sometimes are sometimes worried how long this will uh, will it take, how much longer are we going to uh, to be sending weapons. So the easiest way to cut it short and to avoid this fatigue is to sit down, make a plan, make a strategy, help Ukraine as much as they need and end this war here and now. I will subscribe to every word uh, 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 Radek said. Mm. You know, sometimes when I was ambassador here from 2010 to 15 and I heard so those all those romantic speeches about reset with Russia. I was thinking, is it America? I felt more Americans than those authors of appeasement policy. Because what it means appeasement, you're like embracing the evil, embracing something that is completely different uh, from your values. And you have very stupid idea that with the money, you can change the killer like pouring money into his pockets, opening the markets, giving him technology, you will make him, I don't know, priest? I don't know. You will civilize it. It's so stupid. If you give him money, you demand him to be democratic, respect human rights, minorities, you know, be, you know, it's an exchange. You build that society according to your model. You fight for that freedom. You never give money. So, only last year, the civilized West started to decouple from Russia. But what about China? What are you doing with China? 
you know, China turns Russian to get gasoline station, but it's pumping all the muscles against civilization. So decouple, you know, little Lithuania, seeing Taiwan like next to Ukraine, open Taiwanese representation. We're extending all the ties because we see this is the next war there. We are the litmus test, like Karl Bildt was calling us from 93. We feel it because we are the frontline nation. We know when somebody is going to be attacked. Nobody was listening. But decouple now, create alternative chains. And you know, we did it and China sanctioned us heavily, everything. They said, oh, the Fianini economy will kind of you know, fell down by 5%. You know what? Last year was the biggest growth in Lithuanian economy. Together with American brothers and sisters, we entered far away to Australia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, all those wonderful, great countries, and, and we grew. Our trade with America grew. And now I'm kind of happy. I don't have any useful idiots in my body. No Chinese, no Russian agents. My trade is 98% just with free and democratic countries. I know even, even the Third World War happens tomorrow. If we wake up with some little news in Taiwan Straits, I'm okay. But you are not okay. Germany is not okay. I was in Italy, an Italian brother said to me, oh my God, we need to go to Lithuania to have some expertise because we are in deep problem with previous governments tying our hands to China five-star movement and so on. So decouple now, mm -hmm. you know, build, you know, may have a strategy. If Lithuanians and Poles are telling to you, you have six months till Vilnius NATO summit to save the world in our part, to, you know, make it very clear to Russians that Ukraine is not yours, it's not gray zone, it's NATO, forget about it, as you said, for, for Russians in 93 in the Baltic, more or less case, and Polish, you know, advancing your plans. End of story, you save the world. But if you continue appeasing and playing and doing nothing, evil comes by itself when you do nothing. It will finally destroy your own lives and your own economies. I would say I'm not going to defend Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton by any stretch of the imagination. I think the reset was a huge mistake, and we have deluded ourselves um, over time. But I still have hope that intuitively the average American grasps what's at stake in Ukraine. And one can see that just by traveling into rural America and seeing Ukrainian flags in places who yes. you know, couldn't even find it necessarily on a map. But we recognize that when somebody named Vladimir Putin you know, the very quintessential Russian bad guy invades brutally another country that there's a right and wrong dimension here. But even beyond that, you know, we've grown a bit war wary over the years because uh, there's a perception that we've invested in these, uh, these, um, these sort of liberal democratic crusades, be it in particular in Iraq, but to a certain extent also in Afghanistan. But, but now there's an additional layered argument here for Ukraine, and that is that there's a hard headed national interest at stake, connection to Taiwan. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact that the transatlantic economy is really the centerpiece of our trading relationships mm -hmm. in the world. Something like 45 or 46 U.S. states trade more with Europe than they do with China. Mm -hmm. um, and if Russia is able to break through, destroy Ukraine, and begin to threaten you know, the borders of, of NATO and the rest of, of Europe, um, the system begins to really collapse. Not to mention, how is Europe going to support an American effort on China mm -hmm. when it's under threat? Um, from Russia. So there's a lot of, I think, also very hard-headed national interest arguments that one can make, divorced from the obvious right and wrong, which I wouldn't, you know, uh, diminish at all in the, in, the, in the Russian war crimes that are being committed in places like Dnipro or the, or the torture chambers found in, yes. in, 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 in Kherson. God knows what happened in Mariupol. We don't have any insight there, et cetera. Um, but, um, but I still have hope that there is an American character, an American soul there. We just need, uh, need strong leadership and uh, you know, we have an American president who's a bit aged and doesn't get out there as much and make the argument. The State of the Union is coming up. Hopefully that's an opportunity for him to, to show some energy and actually speak to what's at stake. Um, but from that high-minded comment to something more pedestrian, uh, you're a member of the RADA. How is that functioning today? Uh, are you all meeting? Do you actually pass laws? I know there's an emergency powers in play that's been extended for President Zelensky. Um, 
Uh, do you worry at all about the executive having so much power and the parliament being a bit diminished? Of course, during wartime, we with Lincoln know what that's all about, but, but explain those dynamics to us a little bit. Uh, we are fu functioning very effectively. Uh, uh, we hold uh, plenary days. Uh, usually it might be like two days in a row. The only uh, thing that for safety reasons we don't uh, tell when exactly we have these plenary days. We can, re uh, we can share information about that even on Facebook only one hour after it this plenary is finished. But, uh, Do you meet in the actual parliament? Yes, or in a yes, location? yeah. No, we meet in the building of parliament. Luckily, due to Americans, we have a reliable air defense, for which I'm extremely grateful as a citizen of Ukraine, as a member of parliament. So, uh, oh, interestingly, we have more unity among ruling party, ruling faction, and opposition. Uh, we uh, hold, for example, online discussion of the bills, and uh, we are trying to adopt these bills by way of consensus when opposition is also, also involved. We became, in some ways, even more effective. And uh, in my observation, uh, the concentration of power in the hands of president uh, didn't happen. We still have a um, democratic process. We still have our own checks and balances and we still have a parliamentary presidential republic. Well, it'll be a sign that you've won the war when you all start fighting with each other again in a normal <laughs> uh, democratic yes. process. Well, thank you to all three chairmen for being here today. It's a real thank pleasure you. for us to host you at Hudson Institute. Uh, please join us for future events at Hudson.org. You can read all of our materials on Ukraine, the war, a strategy for victory, the weapon systems that we know the Ukrainians need, the support that they deserve, um, on our page at Hudson.org, also on the Center for Europe and Eurasia's page within Hudson.org. Again, I'm Peter Rouse, Senior Fellow and Director of the Center here, and uh, it's been a real pleasure having you three here today. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you much. very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.